please welcome Dr. Joe Altapeter. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Joe, and I spend a lot of time thinking about quantum computing at DARPA. And specifically, I spend a lot of time thinking about if quantum computers are going to be revolutionary or not. Uh, and this is a harder problem than you might think, because when I think about the 10 smartest physicists I know, about half of them are convinced this is going to be the most important technology of the 21st century. It's going to revolutionize every one of the topics you see on the screen and more. The problem is the other half of the 10 smartest physicists I know are convinced that you are never going to be able to build a quantum computer. And even if you could, it is never going to solve a problem that a classical supercomputer would not be able to solve. And so how do we make progress on this is one of the big questions we have at DARPA. Today, since I only have five minutes, I am going to try to give you a sense of why the first group might be right. Why might these be able to solve revolutionary problems? And I'm going to start by just thinking about one example, nitrogen fixation. Now, you might be thinking, out of all of those revolutionary problems on the previous slide, fertilizer was the best example that I could come up with. I couldn't even get a color photo to show you about this problem. Uh, if you're asking that question, it might surprise you to learn that we currently spend somewhere between 1% and 2% of the global energy supply just smashing together nitrogen and hydrogen at really high temperatures to make ammonia, to make fertilizers. Not 1% of Atlanta's energy supply or 1% of Georgia's energy supply, but 1% of Earth's energy supply. And the reason that is surprising and concerning is that we know that uh, nature does this in the woods at perfectly normal temperatures and perfectly normal pressures uh, using an enzyme called nitrogenase, and they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and even though we've known this for 100 years, we have no idea how to replicate this in an industrial process. And the reason is that if you think about this enzyme, this little tinker toy shown in the foreground of this slide, uh, we can't just say, well, how does this thing bend and like push the nitrogens and the hydrogens together? You'd think that it would be relatively straightforward to try to figure out how this works. But molecules are quantum mechanical objects. And so this molecule, like all molecules, can exist in multiple shapes at the same time. And what's more, uh, the number of different shapes it can exist in at the same time it grows exponentially with the number of atoms in the molecule. And not only, it's not even a factor of choosing which of those exponential space of shapes it has to take to work. It needs to simultaneously exist in just the right combination of hundreds of thousands or billions of shapes at the same time in just the right way to pull off this chemical magic trick. Uh, and so that's why classical computers can't solve this problem. So what if we tried to build a computer that had the same capabilities to solve the same problem? A quantum bit is different than a classical bit. A classical bit is a zero or a one, a yes or a no. A quantum bit is a zero or a one or an infinite number of shades of maybe. And we normal th normally think about these states as living on or inside a sphere. So if you had an electron spin, for example, you could measure it up and down or left and right or front and back, and you'd always get two answers. But in a very real sense, it can exist in all of those states at the same time. Uh, and if you put a bunch of these together, you get that same behavior we saw before, that the number of possible measurements you can get of a quantum computer scales the same way as a classical computer, but it can take on an exponentially growing number of states and exist in them all at the same time. And there's reason to believe that because of this, this might be able to solve hard problems that have the same mathematical character. So where are we in this problem? Well, we've been able to build quantum computers that can solve problems that no classical computer can solve. But so far, we haven't been able to qu build quantum computers that can solve useful problems that classical computers aren't able to solve. And so we don't know the time scale from going from really difficult, really impressive science experiments to honest to goodness change the world quantum supercomputers. So when I think about this question of where we are today, I often think about the Wright brothers' first flight. And I want you to imagine if you were there on that beach in 1903, having seen that 30-second flight, what insights would you have needed to realize that 40 years later, someone was going to create a real flying car? And what extra insights would you have needed to realize that 75 years after that, flying cars still would not be useful? Or to, fig to figure out that 
by the end of the 1960s, we'd be able to land on a moon by completely changing how this flying machine works. These are the kinds of insights we want about quantum computers. And if you think you have them, then DARPA would really like your help. Thank you.